Thanks, Barry. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Stephen. I, um, I've never seen Desperate Housewives, but it sounds like that's what's happening here. I wonder if you've ever been desperate for something. Uh, I mean, really desperate, right? Where every moment without whatever it is you're desperate for feels like really agonizing or painful or empty and like it's almost like hell on earth. Maybe you've been desperate for water while you've been out on a bushwalk. Maybe you've been desperate to get to the toilet and you're, you're in the car ride home and you know just five more minutes, but it's, you know, it's tough. I'm sure we've all felt that desperation before, the sweat down our back. Maybe you've been desperate for love, for the person, for that person, you know, to pick up the phone or to, to give you a smile, to look at you, to let you know that there's hope for the relationship. Or maybe you've been desperate for a child praying that you'd see the all-important two lines on that testing kit um, and breaking down when there's inevitably only one. So we meet in today's section of, of Scripture in the story of Genesis, the three characters of Jacob, Leah, and Rachel, and we meet them as three desperate people. They're desperate individuals, and they're frustrated with their life circumstance. They, they, they are three people who are so frustrated with life not going the way that they want it to. They are desperate to fill this void in their hearts, this sort of emptiness and longing with, with something that they hope will satisfy that emptiness and satisfy that longing and save them from the discontent they feel with their lives. So we're going to look at these three characters and then We'll end by looking at Jesus as the answer to our desperate souls. How about we pray before we come to God's Word? Lord, we thank you for your Word this morning. And as we look at Rachel and Leah and Jacob, and um, we, we think about this story about them being desperate and, and fighting for kids and all these things, Lord, that we'd be able to see what this means to us, that we'd be able to learn what you're trying to teach us and that we'd be able to go and apply it to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jacob's, uh, like Ferry said, Jacob's reached the land of his uncle, right? Uh, Laban or Laban, uh, his, his mother, Rebecca's older brother. And um, the first place he goes to is the well. And we know, apparently, that the well in Jacob's time is like the hottest meeting place for eligible bachelors and bachelorettes. Uh, it's the Christian mingle of Jacob's time. And Jacob probably falls in love with uh, Rachel at first sight. And when Laban, his uncle, offers Jacob payment for working for him and working under him, Jacob already knows what he wants. He wants Rachel. So verse 14 down, he says, uh, Lab Lab Laban said to him, you're my own flesh and blood. After Jacob had stayed in for a whole month, Laban said to him, just because you're a relative of mine, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Uh, and now Laban had two daughters. Uh, the name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. And his uncle said, it's better that I give it to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel, but they seemed like only a few days to him because, because of his love for her. So here's Jacob. He's a, he's a man and he's head over heels in love with this beautiful girl, Rachel. Seven years of hard work feels like just a few days to him, and we all remember what that felt like when we first dated our wife or husband. It's probably different now. Seven years probably feels like seven years now, but I mean, and in some way, we might think like, oh, it'd be lovely to meet someone like Jacob, right? Oh, it'd be lovely to meet someone like Jacob. He only has eyes for one girl. He only has eyes for me. Seven years feels like a few days to him. That's how much he loves me. But I want us to have a think about what's really going on here with Jacob. 
uh, because last week we noticed that Jacob is, um, is homeless, right, in more than one sense. Jacob is empty relationally and emotionally, physically and spiritually. He's isolated, he's alone, he's separated from his family, and he's also left the land of God's promise, his inheritance. He's kicked out of the land. So we have Jacob who's alone and, and, and empty in so many ways, and then he falls in love with this girl, and unfortunately, I don't think, and the Bible doesn't tell us, uh, it's leading us to think that, unfortunately, Jacob isn't in love with Rachel because of her personality, right? Rachel, the Bible says, was a stunning woman. She had a lovely figure. She was beautiful. And in verse 21, to really bring this home to us, this is what Jacob says to his uncle. After seven years of work, he said, okay, after seven years of work, I want to marry Rachel. This is what Jacob says to his uncle. He says, Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife, my time is completed, and I want to make love to her. I mean, okay, look, if I was Laban, and if I'm Rachel's dad, I'm ready to go to jail, right? Because, I'm sorry, you're not speaking about my daughter like that. You're not saying, hey, give me your daughter, I'm going to go have sex with her now. That's, that's, that, I'm sorry, that's not how you're talking about it. But this tells us a lot about Jacob, right? Jacob is so desperate, relationally emotionally, physically, that all his hopes to satisfy that emptiness rests really for him upon this one young and pretty girl who he loves and essentially can't wait to have sex with. He thinks, if I can just have this girl, right, she'll satisfy my emotional emptiness. She'll satisfy my sexual needs. She'll plug up the the, the desperation and the longing that I have in myself. And, and isn't this so often the mindset that we take with our relationships as well? To somehow get the person, whether it be our husband or our boyfriend or girlfriend or our wife or even our children, to get them to fill up some sort of hole that's in our hearts, some sort of longing and desperation that, that we want satisfied and our relationships are a means to that end. And, um, and I want to say, isn't this the reason why pornography in our culture is so appealing? It's a quick fix to relational and emotional and sexual emptiness and longing. But just like pornography and just like those sorts of relationships, Jacob isn't actually left content. He's not actually left satisfied. He's, he's left unsatisfied and even more frustrated. Because what does he find on his wedding night? When everything's supposed to have gone well, he's like, okay, look, now I've, I've got Rachel. I can sleep with her now. He's probably drunk. He gets into bed. He wakes up the next morning. And who's in bed with him? It's not Rachel. It's Leah. Jacob gets a taste of his own medicine. Right? The deceiver becomes deceived. He suffers, and he ends up suffering a total of 14 years, 14 years of hard work just to marry Rachel. And even after he marries Rachel, he finds himself stuck between two competing sisters. One whom he doesn't really love anyway, and he was tricked into marrying. And then the other one, he does love, but he can never make her happy. Rachel is happy, isn't happy, because she doesn't have children. So, so Jacob thinks, if I can have Rachel, I I'd be happy. But what actually happens is that he ends up with Leah. He ends up being tricked by his uncle. He ends up with 14 years of hard work. And then when he eventually does have Rachel, this is what Rachel says to him. She says to him in chapter 30, um, sorry, yeah, 
She says, when Rachel saw that she was not bearing children, Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. So she said to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. And Jacob became angry with her and said, am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? (laughs) Jacob's whole idea of this beautiful relationship with Rachel is not really what he actually gets. Jacob's idea of finding some sort of fulfillment and peace in marrying Rachel to relieve his frustration and longing hasn't really been much of a solution at all. In fact, it's brought him a whole lot of other problems. It's brought him hard work. It's brought him uh, distrust in his uncle. It's brought him Leah. It's brought him his wife Rachel's anger and jealousy. And I, and I love how the late Timothy Keller, this is what he said about this. He said, So often, when we get married, no matter how great you think that marriage is going to be, when when we get a career, no matter how great you think your career is going to be, when you go off to do ministry, no matter how much you think that might do for you, no matter how much you think this is my Rachel, in the morning when we wake up, it's always Leah. You think you're going to bed with Rachel. And in the morning, it's always Leah. There's something for us to think about. But let's leave Jacob there for now and meet Leah. We aren't told much about Leah, except that she's the older sister of Rachel and that she has weak eyes, right? And who knows what weak eyes mean? Nobody really knows exactly what weak eyes means. Um, But I think it's safe to say that the point that the story is making here is that it's somehow comparing Leah and Rachel, right? It says Leah had weak eyes, and then it says Rachel, on the other hand, was beautiful and she had a great figure, right? Well, we can draw our own conclusions about what the Bible is trying to say. Leah had weak eyes, Rachel is beautiful, Jacob loves Rachel, and Jacob sort of tolerates Leah. But Leah is a woman frustrated in her desperate search to be loved. She's desperate to be loved. She is unwanted by her new husband. And to make it worse, if we really think about it, Leah is unwanted by her own dad, isn't she? I mean, her dad threw her into this marriage as if the only way anyone was going to marry his daughter, Leah, was if he tricked them into thinking it was Rachel. That's her life. She's been used by her dad. What a degrading and humiliating experience for Leah. Leah, the unwanted, unloved, maybe even the ugly duckling, thinks that the only way, the only way, to fulfill, uh, the only way out of her desperation to feel her emptiness and satisfy her desperate longing to be loved is by having children for Jacob. And when we read the way she, she names her sons, it gives us an insight into what she's going through and it breaks your heart, doesn't it? I mean, verse 32 down. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, which means to see. For she said, it's because the Lord has seen my misery and surely my husband will love me now. Surely Jacob will see me now, right? She conceived again and when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I'm not loved, he gave, this, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon, which means to hear. Surely Jacob will hear me now. And again she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, now at last my husband will become attached to me because I've borne him three sons. So he was named Levi, which means attached. Surely my husband, Jacob, will be attached to me now, right? See see what she's doing? She's saying, if I have babies and if I have sons, surely my husband will love me. And it'll somehow fix my life. But of course it doesn't. 
Leah has lots of sons, but Jacob still loves Rachel. You know what Leah really needs? You know what we need? Look, Leah needs to know the one who really loves her. She needs to know the one who really loves her, the, the husband who would cherish her and love her in her unattractiveness. Now, someone put it this way. This story of Leah is almost a story of God saying, look, even if nobody else wants to be the husband of Leah, I will be. This is God saying, even if everybody wants to choose Rachel, I'm going to choose Leah. And maybe Leah has a momentary realization about the love God has for her. Because on her fourth son, Leah does something different. She conceives again, and when she gives birth to this fourth boy, she says, this time I will praise the Lord. And so she named him Judah, which means praise. There's no mention of Jacob in the fourth son. You know, in a beautiful display of God's love for Leah, the writer of Genesis tells us later in chapter 49 that it's through this fourth son, Judah, that God's king will eventually come. God comes to the girl that nobody wanted, the unloved girl, and he takes this unwanted, unloved, maybe even the ugly Leah, and he makes her eventually the mother of Jesus. Okay, that's Leah. Let's look at Rachel for a minute, the beautiful Rachel, the prettiest girl in town. And maybe some of us here, we're reading the story and we're like, hey, you know, I can really relate to Rachel. Um, I certainly can't. In my limited understanding of life with those gifted with physical attractiveness by God, you think life would be be great for Rachel, right? Right? I mean, um, she's young, she's got a great figure, she's beautiful, men swoon for her, uh, she has a husband who loves her. Um, I don't even know if this is an appropriate, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if I'm in the culture enough, she's the Kylie Jenner of Jacob's time, is that like, is that sort of yesterday? Um, and the world is at her fingertips. Surely life is good for her, right? Surely life is good for her. Everyone loves her. But it turns out that Rachel is just as frustrated about her life as Jacob and Leah are. Because Rachel is frustrated in her desperation to have children. She's jealous of Leah, the Bible says. And the Bible doesn't is, is say whether she's you know, is it because she always wanted children? Or is it because she's used to having everything Leah has and more, and she can't bear seeing Leah have children while she doesn't? The Bible doesn't say, but she is jealous of Leah, and she's desperate for children. And in order to satisfy this desperate longing of hers, she tries all sorts of things, right? They, they start this whole war of having servants sleep with Jacob and try to have kids that way. And then and Rachel's like, yeah, finally I had a kid. And, and then they start trading herbs. They, they, they say, look, I, I can give you a mandrake. Okay, then can you trade that with me, you know, a night with Jacob? It's like Jacob is a, I don't know, he's a commodity. He, he's not a husband anymore. And this goes on. The servants have four kids. And then Leah has another two kids, until the Bible tells us that finally Rachel does have a son, and it's only by God's grace that she does. Verse 22, then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and enabled her to conceive. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son and said, God has taken away my disgrace. God has taken away my disgrace. She named him Joseph and said, may the Lord add to me another son. God remembers Rachel, it says. He listens to her. Not when she's doing all this other stuff with the mandrakes and with the servants. 
but only as she comes to the end of herself. Only when she has nothing else to try. And what we notice is that both Leah and Rachel have children only when God enables them to conceive, right? Leah had children when God saw that she was not loved and he enabled her to conceive and Rachel is enabled to conceive in her helplessness. Okay, so that's the story of Rachel, Leah, and Jacob, frustrated people, desperately looking for something to save them from their emptiness. Jacob turning to Rachel and beauty and sex, and Leah turning to to Jacob to try and have his love through children, and and Rachel in her desperation to have children, and, and she's jealous of what she doesn't have. So what can we take away from this story? I think there's at least three things for us to think about. The first is, of course, to ask ourselves the question, what are you desperate for, right? What is it that you want so desperately that you think will fill the void in your life and in your hearts? What is it? Is it sex like Jacob? Is it the perfect loving husband like Leah? Is it children like Rachel? Or is there something else? I, I'm sure each of us has something. Now, this is what uh, the author C.S. Lewis, he said this about the, the reality that each of us have these deep, deep longings inside of us. And this is what he said. He said, most people, if they have really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. The longings which arise in us when we first fall in love, or we first think of some foreign country, or first take up some subject that excites us are longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning can actually really satisfy. And I'm not speaking, he says, of what would be called unsuccessful marriages or unsuccessful holidays or unsuccessful careers. I'm speaking of the best possible ones, there was something we have grasped at in that first moment of longing, which just fades away in the reality. The spouse may be a good spouse. The hotels and scenery may have been excellent, and chemistry may be a very interesting job. I probably disagree, but something has evaded us. And then he goes on to say this, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world, something greater, eternal, supernatural. What C.S. Lewis is getting at is this. Is there a longing inside of each of you that only God can feel that you're trying to fill with something else? Okay, second, since this this chapter is talking about love and marriage and children, we have to say this, don't enter into a relationship, whether it be dating or marriage, thinking that it can take the place of God to give you the love and satisfaction you want. Uh, It will not, right? Because you and the other person are imperfect. You will fail to love them and they will fail to love you. They will always fall short of the mark in some way And this is not me being pessimistic. I love my wife. If you're single, knowing this will make you less desperate to get out of singleness because you you, you realize, well, okay, well, this just uh, getting out of singleness isn't the answer to life. And if you're married, it will make you less angry and less less disappointed at your spouse for his or her imperfections. It will take away unnecessary pressure for your partner or even your children to satisfy you in the way you want to be squeezed into whatever hole uh, and shape you want to be filled in your heart and and you'll learn what it really means to love someone by putting their needs before your own. Thirdly, we have to know that God comes always to the frustrated and the desperate and the lowly. The answer God gives to Rachel and Jacob and Leah is that Rachel needs to be put in a situation that she cannot fix, right, with her servants or with her plants. 
so that she learns that there's really only one place for her to go for help. Jacob needs to be put in a place where, that he can't manipulate and, and deceive and, and get out of. In fact, where he himself is manipulated and deceived so that he learns to, to come and to trust in God. And Leah, unloved as she was, needs to know that the Lord sees and provides and hears and is worthy to be praised. God teaches each of them, each of these people, these things. And God does this because God loves the unloved. God does this because He loves the marginalized. He loves the one who is helpless. He loves the one who desperately is longing and recognizes their longing for something better. When God came to earth in Jesus Christ, He comes as the son of Leah, in one sense physically through Judah, but not just because of that, but because He comes as the unwanted and unloved man. He had no outward beauty that we should desire Him. He was abandoned by those closest to Him. Jesus willingly went to the cross, which is the one place where because He had taken on all the sin and the brokenness and the desperation and the ugliness of you and me, He goes to the cross, and even the Father in heaven turns His face away from Jesus so that Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is the unwanted and unloved man, and He does it willingly for you and me. He describes His mission in this way, Luke chapter 4, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. See, the gospel and the good news, Jesus is for the poor. It's for the prisoners, the blind, the oppressed, the weak, the hurting, the sick, the lost, the unloved, the unwanted, the helpless, the desperate. And if you cannot admit that you are a hopeless sinner and a hopeless failure morally, spiritually, that you are absolutely lost and that you have no hope to save yourself in any way apart from the grace of God, then friends, the Bible is telling us, unless you are that, then you are not weak enough to know Jesus. Your pride and reluctance to be completely weak in front of the King of Kings will lead you to death. But on the other hand, if you recognize that you have been desperate for something, some longing that you think you, you might have found in, in love or in a husband or in children or something else, then let me tell you that what your soul desperately really needs is Jesus Himself. I'm going to go straight into the Lord's Supper uh, because the Lord's Supper demonstrates to us uh, to assure us that God really did meet us in our greatest need. He feels what our souls so desperately long for, to be known and be loved and be seen and heard, as well as our need to be saved from the sin that has cursed us, to be people who reject and have become far from God who loves us, but also cursed us to be people who hurt the people around us to feel our selfish need instead of truly loving them. And we see that in the story of Jacob and Leah and Rachel as they use each other, even Laban. God sends us His own Son, Jesus Christ, to become sin for us and to die on the cross, and um, Jesus gives us this act of communion for Christians to give thanks for His sacrifice and be comforted by the pledge of His love for us. As we take part in this meal in a minute, we are reminded of our unity to Christ, our bond with Christ, but also our bond with each other. It tells us that we are committed to Jesus, to loving Jesus and obeying Jesus, and it tells us we're committed to each other in Jesus, to loving each other and to serving each other as we wait for Jesus to return.
So remembering that the Lord's Supper communion is a sign and seal of our walk with God and with each other, I'm going to invite every one of us here who professes a sincere faith in Christ and who live according to His Word and have a clear conscience in their walk with the Lord, not because you're without sin, not because you have complete control over your frustrations and desperations and longings, but because you have placed all your hope and trust in Christ alone. If that is you, then please join in taking part in this meal. If you're visiting today and you're a committed member of another church that serves Christ and proclaims Christ, then you're also welcome to join. If that is not you, if none of these things are you, you have not placed your faith in Jesus, you're not united to faith in Christ and His body, the church, then you can let the bread and wine pass by you today. And our prayer is that you would come to know Jesus who is near to those who realize their desperate need of something greater than anything the world can offer and anything you can offer for yourself. I'm going to invite Adi. We'll set this up and we'll come around and we'll uh, hand out the elements and I think during that some song will be playing in the background.